Psychedelics Today with Joe and Kyle. Today we're talking about MDMA psychotherapy training. Um, Kyle just got to attend uh, five days, was it? Yeah, I think it was six days. It was uh, a Sunday through Saturday. Yeah, so six days. That's pretty awesome. So, yeah, six days of training on MDMA psychotherapy. And uh, was it good? Was it worth it? Yeah, it was definitely worth it. I enjoyed every moment of it. It was really cool to connect with a lot of people and um, really informative. So I can't really complain. I felt like I won the lottery, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of folks were there? Um, there were some people from uh, Johns Hopkins. There were a few people from NYU. Um, a, lot of, a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists. Um, I think I might have been... One of the few, I think there were only two students, me and another person. So it was mostly professionals. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, yeah. And who are the lead instructors? Uh, Michael and Annie Mithofer. So the lead uh, researchers that have been, you know, leading the MDMA research for the past few years. That's pretty awesome. And they, they were featured in the book Acid uh, Tests. Yep. Oh, acid Trip. <laughs> Tom test. You're, you're right. I finally got his name, <laughs> Tom Schroeder. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, it was really cool. They're pr- uh, trained breathwork facilitators. He was an emergency room doctor and he was a nurse. Um, and they're co-running a lot of the studies, I think. Yeah. Yeah, they work as a team. Really beautiful team. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we're hoping to talk to them in the future about breathwork, which is going to be really cool if we get that together medical possible medical research on breath work so how how is it formatted i know that you had to watch a lot of video and audio before you went was it similar when you were in person just a lot of a lot of media you got to yeah um so there was an online training component and then there Mm. was the mostly it was watching video and then discussing uh, the video, the content, and asking questions. Right. So it was mostly like video and then discussion format for the whole week. Yeah. Um, and the Michael and Annie would would lead the discussion, or um, sometimes it would just come naturally from the video. Um, so we would be watching um, some therapy sessions, and then maybe somebody had a question about a particular thing that came up, or just something that they were interested in. We'd stop the film, discuss it, debrief, and then keep on rolling. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, how? So I know that they're pretty selective with who they get in there. Who um, did you have to talk to to get included, or did you, did you get a special invite? Um, well, I'm volunteering for MAPS for their integration list. So the person that I'm working with invited me. But, you know, I think they're trying... So, okay, I think that the people that are mostly invited are phase three researchers. People are going to start doing phase three if uh, they move forward with that. And then there's potential that other people can get involved that I think they're trying to apply for this uh, thing called expanded access with the FDA. And I believe... I always forget what what that really entails, but um, I think it allows for more sites to open up and um, to kind of go beyond just like the regular phase three trials that they might have scheduled. That's pretty cool. I I think that's not a bad bad way to go. Um, So the training program, we were talking about it the other day. It's it's not just you go for six days and you're good to go. It's a little longer, right? What, What does that look like? Yeah, it's a five-part series. So there's like a online component and then uh, two in-person components. And then um, there's like a take-home assignment and then there's like an evaluation afterwards. So where was it? The, okay. Where did you go? New York, um, right outside of New York City, like an hour at a little retreat center on the Hudson. That's really great. Yeah. It was a pretty nice place. Yeah, it was wonderful, and it was at the peak of, like, the foliage season, so the colors were just unbelievable. How many how many medical doctors were there that you knew of? 
Um, I'm going to say probably, I don't know, off the top of my head, probably <laughs> half the people that were there were MDs wow. and psychiatrists. That's fantastic. Yeah. And um, some people were, were PhD students and people interested in, in doing this kind of work mostly. Yeah, PH, PhD students. I think there was another master level student there and then um, a few psychologists and then I believe a social worker, maybe two social workers. Um, I can't, I don't remember really everybody's credentials, but you know, it was pretty much like a social worker, psychologists and psychiatrists and I think two students, including me. 20 person group or something like that. Yeah, it was something like that. That's cool. Yeah. So a lot of the material, we talked about it a little bit. It, it, the video didn't to you look as graphic, graphically intense as a breathwork session might look. Um, but there still looked like there was a fair amount of internal stuff going on. And, um, so what, so I guess maybe if you had to think about the difference between what you've seen in breathwork on the, on the mat, working with people and then like what you saw in these videos, was there any like characteristic difference anything specifically well you know in breath work we talk about the inner healing intelligence and about going in and they talk about that as well so like when they're prepping mm -hmm. people to uh do an mdma session they they really it's a non-directive approach and they're really trying to let the person's inner healing intelligence guide them so in that regard, it's very similar uh, with people going in and, you know, having control of their session, whether, you know, they want to talk to somebody, you know, in breath work, we, we encourage people not to talk to just kind of keep this internal process. But right. in the MDMA sessions, you know, if they want to talk, then they are free to talk to the therapist guiding them. Uh, as for moving around, I was thinking about that a lot and it didn't seem like a lot of people had movement. There was definitely body work and some people wanted to get up and just like walk around during their session, maybe just to like brush off some energy. But you know, yeah, we did. I didn't see any of the, uh, you know, the kicking or the rolling. It seemed mm -hmm. a little bit calmer, but yeah. my thought too is also that when you're doing breath work, you have this group process going and once somebody starts going off and rolling around or you hear the person across the room screaming, it almost invites you to do that as well. And, you know, I was kind of wondering about that, like, huh, like I wonder what would happen if this was in a group setting and it was kind of like breath work where people were lying on the mat and were really encouraged to do that. Um, right. It would be one really interesting avenue to explore because even though this is cheaper than, you know, perpetual therapy and perpetual VA benefits or whatever, it's still an expensive form of therapy. Um, you know, that much time with a doctor, that much time with, you know, a, a nurse and, you know, having a, uh, somebody supervise you while you're sleeping you know, that kind of stuff that, that adds up. But what if you did it in a group context and you could do 10, 15 people at a time, you know, maybe you double the medical staff, Yeah, um, but you're still cutting costs by, you know, in a fifth. Yeah. And I think that topic did come up over the week. I think there was a question about doing it in a group and, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I think as this research progresses and uh, the protocol unfolds and who knows, maybe group work will be involved in the future, but it seems right now it'll probably stay pretty individualized. Right. Right. Absolutely. I, I think probably what needs to happen is we'll have to finish phase three and then we'll probably need some validation on, on the methods of holotropic breath work where it's, you know, almost identical really and then open it up to the group as a result of success in that research mm -hmm. um you know further cutting costs or you know perhaps once it's available there can be easier and cheaper experimentation with the methods and research um but yeah for your students out there think about it talk to your <laughs> advisors about how you could put that together because that cutting costs on this kind of stuff is really important to get yeah. access to everybody. 
Yeah, it is very time uh, extensive. And I mean, you know, some of the sessions, I think they're there for eight hours. You know, the session might last like five or six hours. But yeah, and then the, the client or the patient has to stay overnight. And, you know, I don't know if that will be like that if if mdma becomes legal but i think for the research right now that's just the protocol but yeah it's a very time extensive therapy um and if you've ever sat for breath work or anything like that you know it's it's a lot to take in and for the therapist side it's probably pretty emotionally draining at times um, but also really rewarding and i'm also thinking about the group process thing with uh, MDMA, you know, I, I was just thinking, you know, what what if a person really wants to talk about their trauma? You know, I don't know. Do, would would people in the group talk about it together, or would there be like therapists just giving one on one attention? So yeah, I don't know. It's it's a lot of good questions to ask, and um, yeah, would it be acceptable as a, like a group form? I don't know. Yeah, how do we make that something that's that's reasonable for the for the Western? Um, establishment I, I think I think we could make it work it just takes time so what kind of stuff um, do you think you learned like what are some of your biggest lessons coming out of that week of training mm, well since I hmm, that's a good question and I've been I've been trying to think about it all week as I've been trying to right. integrate the material but it was really great to learn about the the protocol and somehow mm-hmm. like the um, the FDA process and some of the more um, you know uh, what's the word that I'm looking for rigorous yeah uh, yeah I, I guess rigorous stuff yeah yeah how to have scientific rigor with this kind of thing it's super complicated. Yeah. Like the placebos are ridiculous. Like how could you, I think the best thing that I read about for placebos is just dosage. Yeah. So like kind of like quadruple the dose for placebo dose or like non placebo dose. Oh, that was something interesting that I, that I learned with the, um, with one of like that kind of the active pr- pl- placebos that they were doing, it was like 37.5 milligrams so it was a really low dose, but I think a lot of people found it to be really agitating because it brought on a lot of anxiety for them. And I think some of their uh, their cap scores and stuff uh, stayed the same or it might have increased or maybe it just went down a little bit. I don't remember 100%. But it was just interesting that like low doses of MDMA actually cause like more anxiety than uh, benefit. <laughs> that is something to pay attention to. Um, from like a holotropic breathwork perspective, it's like, uh, that is just kind of an agitating force that, that gives you access, more easy access to those things. Yeah. But it's also like, you know, you're taking an amphetamine and you're, you're chilling on the couch. Yeah. Like that's (laughs) like you drink 10 cups of coffee and you have to sit in the room. Yeah. Like that's no good. Yeah. (laughs) But you know, at the higher doses, people are able to access that like inner healing intelligence and their processes uh, unfolds a little bit easier. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And there was like another thing. I mean, I think this is just like really good life lesson in general, but uh, there is always that comment, trust the medicine, you know, and you can convert that (laughs) to trust the process and then don't get ahead of the medicine because some people might want to process things uh, really quickly. And like get ahead of the process and to come back to the body and come back to the feelings. I, I think that's a really important lesson just in life in general. Cause sometimes we can get ahead of ourselves and like intellectualize things and, Oh, we got it figured out. And just that simple reminder of, you know, trust, trust the medicine, stay with it. And, um, you know, don't get ahead of the process because, you know, there's probably more to unfold. Yeah. That's interesting. What kind of questions were you like, uh, just off the top of your head, what kind of stuff were you seeing other people come into the classes with and, and curious about? Mm. So I know it's like all different experience levels, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people asked about like measurement tools and assessments and just the different, uh, 
like the scores people are really interested in some of the you know those clinical results and maybe why they use certain assessment tools and stuff like that so a lot of it was like logistical um right you know why this protocol why this why that and then just like um clarifying some stuff but i also found it really interesting um some questions around body work so you know michael and annie are trained in holotropic breath work and they they use that body work technique that they learned and so you know a lot of people are watching some of these videos and they might have been using some of that body work and you know most people are, weren't trained in uh, holotropic breath work or anything like that so i think the body work thing was a big question on how did they know, react when they saw the body work going down on the video um i think people were really intrigued by it you know um because in main you know mainstream psychiatry and even psych psychology counseling and stuff like that like we don't use the body and it's almost unethical to touch your patients so i think <laughs> uh uh there was a funny story maybe about uh stan groff like talking about how he would get on the floor with the patients um you know it, and it's, it's just not ethical in um mainstream psychiatry and counseling and stuff like that but you know in this pr in this uh realm it, it's kind of useful to uh do body work with certain people if their process is calling for it and you know we i'm sure you've seen it in breathwork sessions where like maybe you don't experiment with body work and then you get body work done during another session and you see how beneficial it was yeah yeah that's a big deal like how <laughs> it's it's funny to see the resistance too because it's like anything from no don't touch me get away from me or no i don't think it's going to help or no i'm i'm done and then if you can <clears throat> work it on and they agree to do some body work you can make some substantial progress and it, it's often very like uh, surprising yeah and i kind of how I, much happens i come back to a recent uh session that i had i don't know maybe like a year ago, the last time I did breath work. And, oh my God, I can't believe it's that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, maybe it's a little less than a year ago. Um, but, you know, I was doing, I was in a, in a body work. Uh, somebody was doing body work on me kind of like early on. And, right. you know, I thought my, my session was done. And then they came back to check in with me like when I was like wrapping up and the music ended. And then they did like another like 10, 15 minutes of body work and I just had more stuff there. So it, it is really interesting how much, yeah. you know, working with the body can really like unleash stuff and help the process resolve. Yeah. Like I, I don't really know how professionals model stuff, but if you think about it, like kind of in a Freudian sense where these things have kind of a libidinal charge. Like you've, you've really charged up your system and have unique level of access to all this stuff, all this right. subconscious stuff. Um, and why not work on it now instead of later? Right. Um, it, it only really helps. Yeah, definitely. So you were saying something about measures earlier. I, I was just checking out, um, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the article <clears throat> or the study where they did, um, this, the title was something like 11,000 participants or 11,000 breathwork sessions with, um, in a mental hospital. Uh, it's like something like 500 breathers and, um, they kept going for it. Um, the only thing they used for a measure, which is kind of disappointing was something like, um, they had mythopoetic experiences or perinatal experiences. Hmm. There's no actual like test used as a diagnostic um, I found that really disappointing. Huh. Specifically for perinatal experiences? Like, well, you know, all they, all they took down was you had this mythopoetic or perinatal experience hmm. across however many sessions you did. And I'm like, eh, like, it's cool as kind of like a safety study to show that you can do this in a hospital. I've seen hundreds of people and you don't have any negative effects. But there's, there's so many benefits that you could have documented hmm better as a mental health professional in a hospital like why didn't you use 
a measure that some people might be interested in. Right. Yeah. And I, I did see that paper and I remember reading through it. I just don't remember too much about it because it was like years ago. Yeah. I only checked it out today. Yeah. But I think like, I don't know, I'm in an assessments class right now. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, any professionals listening, you know, I'm still learning a lot of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it seems like, you know, I think like PhD psychologists and psychiatrists are trained in assessment. Counselors aren't necessarily trained in assessments. And so like, if you were just like a master's level counselor and you weren't necessarily trained in a specific assessment, you know, you, you'd have to get some extra training to learn how to administrate them. And there's so many different types of measures and assessments out there. Um, I just learned that I think the John Hopkins team uses, I forget what it's called, but they have one based off of like mystical experiences and they're using like the updated black Friday measure, right? Yeah, I, and I that, think that's what they're doing. Mm. And then they have so another like, one about like uh, openness. I think it was called like Neo. And uh, I don't remember. Yeah, I. It's it's probably smart that they're doing something that's not related to mystical experiences because, like, I I don't know that it's generally accepted in medicine that mystical experiences are helpful. Mm. Um, it, we might get there eventually. It seems to be that way, but uh, I think it could also, like, if, if doctors are reading it and there's no real data, it sounds like mania. <laughs> like, how did you get all oceanic and manic for, for two hours? Is that dangerous? Right, yeah. <laughs> what are the long term? So, like, I, I, th- I think there's something worth looking at there. You know, perhaps what they're getting at is... Um, classically speaking we have this religious literature that you know our culture is kind of based on and these experiences are documented in there so maybe maybe that's what they're getting at but i don't i don't know that the world's the same as it was in the 60s so like i you know it's it's cool data i like it i personally want to know about it but i think to convince medical folks we, we need multiple measures it sounds like they're doing that yeah they um, have um a bunch of different ones um that they've been using. So, I mean, yeah, they, they use the, the caps measure. So, uh, the measurement, to, for PTSD, um, is cap it, specifically for PTSD. It's the clinical administered PT, PTSD scale. Um, they've also had okay. some second secondary measures, um, like the Beck depression inventory, um, the, you know, measured in sleep and then, they had this oh yeah they're using the other one um neo pi the uh it's about extroversion and openness personality inventory um okay and then they were doing they some other sa- they were doing some safety measures too with like suicide rating so they're using uh the columbia suicide severity rating scale and then during the um like during the session they also had to do um like a distress measure so during sessions people would be asked like on a scale from like i don't know what it was out of i think one to ten um mm-hmm. they, they would use another one called sud the subjective units of distress measure while people were in session just to measure you know what, what they were feeling so they would actually go to the people and ask questions. Yeah. During the session, session, like say like when they needed to take their temperature, the blood pressure machine went off. Um, they would ask like, you know, how how are you feeling? Like what, what's your sud scale right now? Right. Just thinking about applying that to breath work. That sounds so complicated. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I I don't know about those interruptions in between, but you know, perhaps for, you know, 50 people total, for a study it's okay to interrupt but it, it didn't seem like it bothered too many people but you know mm-hmm. it was also from the video and you know i w- right. wasn't, wasn't there for all those sessions but <laughs> right yeah did they have any people who, who had been in the therapy come talk to you guys like patients no no that would have been really cool though right yeah for, for, for listeners it, it sounds like we might be able to get a few folks who have been through the, the study as well, some people have been pretty open and public about it. Uh-huh. Um, and so, you know, those people would probably be open to talking, but 
you mm-hmm. know, all the, all the other stuff's pretty confidential. Yeah. You guys had to comply with like uh, HIPAA rules, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sign a confidentiality agreement and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> But, you know, so, some, some people came out and talked about their experience, like um, the person that uh, Tom Schroeder highlighted an acid test, you know, his story is pretty public, that, that person. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there and there's a, a few people in Boulder I might have access to. I'm going to try to develop those leads a little bit and, and see if they're willing to talk. Um, cool. I think that'd be really cool. What, um, so keeping the confidentiality agreement in mind... Is there anything that was was super remarkable um, from the training that you that you saw in those videos, or maybe even commentary from the trainers about yeah, you, stuff? You know, it was I, I wrote down a few things in my notebook, but I don't have it on me. Um, but just some general statements that some of the people made mm-hmm. while they were in their MDMA sessions, and you know, just talk just witnessing their inner healer come out during these sessions it was just remarkable you know right. um there there was one person that you know was pretty having like flashbacks during their intake uh assessment mm-hmm. and then during you know their regular session it was just pretty you know accessing this inner healer intelligence and just working through stuff it, it's just like remarkable ptsd to, flashbacks what was that PTSD flashbacks. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just remarkable to see how the medicine really, for the most part, from some of the videos, just kind of regulated their fear and their, their distress. And people were just able to yeah. access like this, like stream of consciousness and really kind of work through it. And, you know, there are some people that like, obviously, you know, they had a hard time, a harder time letting go and trusting the medicine and so, you know, it's not a magic bullet for everybody, but for some, for most of the people, it was, uh, it, I mean, it was just amazing. Like I felt honored to just watch somebody's process and, um, it was really cool. And just some so, of the stuff people were saying, I, I don't remember really off my head, but I, you know, I think somebody was saying that, you know, it's like 10 years of therapy in like a few hours. And, and that's a pretty general thing. A lot of people talk about when they talk about breath work or, you know, this type of therapy. So what, what did that resistance look like to, to the drug? Was um, it like a, like a closing up, contracting, regressing thing? Or was it, was it like more violent and standing up and yelling or? No, not violent. Just, um, I guess getting ahead of the medicine, <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to like maybe intellectualize things and try and gain control of the experience rather than letting the experience take over. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Um, as a stimulant might help one do. Yeah. Um, you know, I think about like when breath work, you know, sometimes you can have some really good experiences if you just completely let go and let your body rock with the music or just flow with whatever energy was going through you versus like trying to make something happen. You know, yeah. those sessions where you're like, all right, I, I, I need something to happen. And then nothing ever really unfolds. But some of the more powerful experiences are when you can completely just let go and not really, um, you know, just follow the energy in your body. Absolutely. It, it makes me think of some, sometimes I've, I've gone through it or other people have gone through it. Kind of like what you said about the, the body work, like, you know, maybe 30 minutes into your breath work session, it's not happening. I'm done. Like, let me out of here. I'm finished. And then, you, you know, hopefully you're with a skilled facilitator and they talk you back into relaxing and, and breathing more. It's probably, it might be similar to that. Like you're like, I, I figured it out. Yeah. It's definitely just about my boss being an asshole. So like, let's move on to the, the finishing yeah, it was, part. It was actually funny. There's uh, one session where this person kind of seems stuck or showed resistance. And I just wanted to ask like during that time, I was like, but I, I don't know. I didn't, I was just letting it, the video unfold. But I just wanted to ask like, do you ever do body work when people feel stuck or resistant? And then somebody else asked a question and, and they paused the video. And as soon as they unpaused it, they just started doing body work with the person. And I was like, wow, that's really intuitive and funny. 
Um, <laughs> but you know, I had a session like that with breath work where nothing was happening and I was like, ah, oh, this really sucks. Like, you know, I came down here for the weekend. I really just wanted to like go of things and nothing happened. And I think it was coming towards the end and I was just so frustrated and annoyed. And then, you know, one of the facilitators came over and asked me how my body was feeling. I just said there was some tenseness around my neck and they rolled up a, a towel and just gently placed it over my neck and all of a sudden just that feeling of the towel gently against my neck just it it i just busted open in an experience of like feeling like restricted and feeling all this stress in my life and it was just amazing how it unfolded by just simply doing a little bit of body work like that and you know my session that i didn't think anything was gonna uh didn't think anything was going to happen, ended up unfolding in a really, really strange way that I started ex re-experiencing all this stress from my job. And I had this feeling, it's like, I just need to quit. Like, but it's such a complicated situation because I feel really tied to it and all these different things. And then I went back to work, like, and I think like two weeks later, the boss ended up just giving us an envelope and gave us like a week's notice and he was closing up the shop. I was like, well, I guess that, that worked itself out. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting. So that makes me curious if there's, if there's interest in the, in the world of, of people taking this training to do a breathwork workshop with us that, that focuses on body work. You know, perhaps we could do one in the East and one out here. Um, yeah, you know, when I talked to some people about it there, um, because, you know, a lot of people didn't have experience with body work. I think there was one somatic practitioner there, but it seemed like a lot of people are interested in it. And I think it could be a pretty cool training for people that are getting into this work to have an experience um, in like doing their own body work or having it done for them. Uh, yeah, and then some lecture and like workshop time around it. So we'll do the breath work, and then we'll also like tell them about this. And I think I said not a bad idea. Let's let's investigate that. Um, yeah, I actually um, just sent an email out asking about that with um, you know Dream Shadow to see if they'd be open to it. So yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I I feel like. Uh, you know, Vermont's kind of far away from a lot of folks, but, you know, yeah. realistically, if they want to put in the time, um, it's not that bad. Um, so what, um, what kind of peripheral conversation did you guys get into like afterwards? Was it just speculative about the future of the field and like how to, how to progress it forward, how to make things better? Or what did you guys talk about? Yeah, just exactly that. Just talking about the future, some excitement, um, maybe p some potential like um, roadblocks, uh, you know, just stuff like that. A lot of people are really excited. Um, and I think even somebody at Horizons was giving a talk about their research in MDMA. And I can't remember a hundred percent, but you know, I, I think they said something along the lines like, you know, I'm not doing this research anymore and it's really hard to treat people. It's almost like, you know, a doctor doing surgery without their tools, you know, and it's like, how do you, how do you treat right. people without this now, now that you've experienced it? Um, so yeah, you saw how effective this thing was. It's like, what do you do? Yeah. Which is, it's, it's Just really check sad. out. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, th then there's like also that like frustration of watching this stuff and seeing how beautiful it could be and um, how healing it could be. And just realizing that, you know, we might be still about five years away um, until maybe people in a larger audience can get treated. Because right now, you know, it's just restricted to um, the phase three research going on. Was there any talk of doing it offshore? Somebody did bring that up, um, yeah. and I honestly don't remember what the answer or the conversation was. Right. Yeah, yeah that's too bad. I, yeah. I'm sure that's some sort of clandestine thing that's actually happening, but 
who knows? Well, <laughs> like, I mean, if you look at it, like um, the UK has stuff going on. Switzerland was having stuff go on. And, you know, somebody did bring up like Portugal being decriminalized with their drugs and whatnot. Uh, but I don't remember what we ended up talking about with that. Right. Yeah, it's it's a complicated subject. Yeah, Canada's doing stuff. I mean, that great Vice article came out, and they want to have similar trainings, right? And it seemed kind of cool with that Vice article talking about like wanting to train shamans and stuff, just having like a overarching system to train psychedelic guides. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not a bad um, thing to kind of normalize the field of practitioners a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder though, like I, I hear some stuff like people going to workshops or whatever. And when I hear stuff that happens in groups, sometimes I'm just like, wow, that, that feels like trespassing. That feels like pretty rough, Mm. but the participants are always stoked. They're like, oh yeah, that was very helpful. That was nice. I'm like, (laughs) what? You let them do what to you? (laughs) Or like you they didn't give you food or let you go to sleep for how long? Like, are you serious? Um, I kind of feel that way a little bit about the ayahuasca world too. It's mm-hmm. like, why, why do you have to do it? Why do you have to get started at nine o'clock at night? Mm. Like, what's that about? Well, I think um, in some of those shamanic cultures, that's like when the spirit world is really alive and the visions are heavier and whatnot. So I think they're in that in that realm. There's a, a reason why they do ceremony at night. Yeah, I, I just hope they give enough space in the morning so you can like kind of sleep through the day or just relax enough. Which has got to be hard if you're down in Peru. I mean, trying to sleep through the jungle heat and humidity during the you know sunlight i don't know how anybody does that but. no <laughs> it's uh, amazing yeah. i mean I, like i know everybody loves it when they go they don't really complain all that much but that is true i <laughs> it just, just like that alone makes me go i don't know i live in a very cold place for a reason <laughs> <laughs> but do i really want to go to the, all the way hot steamy <laughs> amazonia well i guess you uh, could pick a time where it's not as crazy hot but <laughs> and there's also people doing it in the high alpine too like there's colombian tribes that are in the mountains there's mm-hmm. there's obviously mountains in peru too so you don't need to do it in the jungle and you know you're still in the amazon amazon basin so it's kind of like you're still getting that cultural blowover or whatever yeah um but yeah it, it's interesting there's a lot of opportunity still for that I, uh, yeah. So let's get back to your training. So, uh, do you think you'll engage in, in the next part anytime soon? Um, well, the next part is only open to people that are gonna, that are accepted to do phase three research. So, um, so you need to like finish your degree and get licensed and then you could, well, it just depends on their phase three research sites. So right now they already have a mapped out and are training people specifically specifically for those sites. Um, one of the other things that they're, I guess, trying to do is apply for this expanded access, um, which I think allows other sites to pop up and then people can do a lot more data, data safety uh, research kind of. Um, and without having to do all the other type of stuff, but, um, yeah, I I always forget what the whole expanded access thing really entails. (laughs) Right. It sounds like it might make it, um, I've talked to some, some oncologists and they, they talk about how there's all these drugs and they're not really allowed to use them without getting certain kinds of approval. Right. Um, so you have to get like, uh, what did she call it? Like compassionate use Mm. access. And then you could use these certain drugs, um, to treat cancers of various kinds or or whatever. Um, specifically related to like the experimental stuff, right? The newer stuff. So this might fit into a similar category. 
I think I think it does. I-, I really think it does. I know there's just there's so much information over the weekend, and then also trying to like balance my schoolwork and s- <laughs> my brain is just like usually all over the place. Which um, you know, it's awesome to do all these different things, but it's also really hard to uh, integrate everything that I'm taking in. Um, Absolutely, I yeah. couldn't really imagine how intense that is. Yeah. I uh, so when I was still in my undergrad doing breathwork workshops, I. I was, you know, under the gun with a lot of school stuff, but I think I would just blow it off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're not doing that. Um, it sounds and like I, you're still on the ball. I blew it off a little bit last week, but yeah, it, it's <laughs> it's a lot to take in um, all that stuff and do these different trainings and do this and do that. It's just, it, sometimes I feel like just like an overload of information where I'm like, whoa, I, sometimes I need to slow down. <laughs> Right, right. And it's it's a really cool opportunity you had to be there with, you know, roughly 20 people interested and involved in the field to one degree or another. And and people who have actually executed on this stuff. Um so maybe let what do you remember them saying about breathwork in in front of everybody there or, or people saying about breathwork? I know there was some interest. Yeah, so um, there was a little talk about Groth and breath work, but just talking about how, um, you know, the model, like the protocol was uh, based off of a lot of the early psychedelic research um, with Leo Zeff and Stan Groth and some of these other pioneers. And so the protocol was, you know, based around all this earlier stuff. Um, but, you know, you know breath work was definitely a component of this and just kind of the model of like eye shades and um, music and really focusing on that inner healing intelligence and even the music component too. Like I think they organize, they, they've taken that breathwork music uh, theory and integrated it into how to maybe create a playlist or set something up or the different phases, you know, I don't Did think they, they talk about that kind of a, uh, an exciting arc to a plateau to a to yeah? Follow? Well, they actually they said they cut out the activation phase because obviously right. you, you don't need the heavy drums and the exciting the excitement music right. to get you going because you have a substance that's driving you. Um, so you know it was mostly like that crisis music, the conversion music, and then the resolution music, and then um, you know maybe they would. I think they might have used like the activation music if they did like follow up body work, like during an integration session after to get things activated. So for anybody not listening, there's like four components of like how we compose breath work. And the first is an activation phase where it's a lot of like tribal drumming, um, just really fast paced music to get, uh, participants to use their to guide their breath so it's a really fast <laughs> type of uh, music and then I guess the next phase we would say is kind of like a crisis phase where it gets like a little dark and emotional and eerie um, sometimes I think it's like space music it's just very strange and can bring out bring out emotion and then um, the third is conversion or at least that's the term that Lenny always used. Um, and that's more of like um, kind of like uh, movie movie music. Um, it still has that emotional uh, component to it, but almost like kind of heartfelt. Um, it's very theatrical. And then you had the resolution where it's like calm and, you know, kind of brings you down, waves crashing, crickets chirping, stuff like that. <laughs> right 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 um it's always interesting uh and it, it's cool they talked about it a lot i um i think there's always room for discussion on that it's inter- well this is kind of like a very western drug but uh <coughs> i remember dimitri talking about using traditional music Mm. Um, as opposed to like who who thought Bach was the right choice. Right. <laughs> you know, because er- early on it really was just kind of like a classical playlist, but I, I bet they fine-tuned it over the years mm-hmm. um, to to include a little bit more stuff. Yeah. Um, 
and obviously the efficacy kind of proves the point. Um, so, you know, why not? Um, something that you just kind of brought up, um, just made me think about somebody actually did bring up the, the idea of using live music with like singing bowls and drums and gongs and like a didgeridoo and stuff like that. But (laughs) I mean, it'd be cool, but you you probably need a lot more people there facilitating. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And how many people in the room at the same time is good. Yeah. It's hard to say. It's like, uh, you know, in time, hopefully we can experiment with that and see what's good. There's plenty of damaged folks out there who need help. And uh, even this research stuff is worth experimenting, you know, to see if they get help. Yeah. Uh, it also might be a really cool, like, research, uh, you know, area of research is whole, like the music. Yeah, absolutely. It would be really difficult, but I think it's worth, there's value enough there to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Um, the session's so long. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, how do you... Yeah. It's almost like you have to do a specific genre in a specific key at a specific <laughs> tempo for the whole session. Yeah. It's like, how much samba can you really listen to for four hours or whatever? Mm, yeah. But, you know, it, it is something that I think people need to look at. Like, how do you make a measure for this stuff? Mm. Um, who knows? I there there are people studying music therapy right not just like art therapy so like you know maybe those people really high end music people in the, in the psych world of psychology might might have some input yeah. yeah that'd be really cool um so did you have any kind of major expectation going into the workshop like just that you're going to get exposed to the stuff or No, you know, I just went in there wanting to learn and connect and just really kind of be with the process. I I wasn't really having high expectations. Like, I I just felt really honored that I could even be there. So, um, you know, just, yeah, I don't know. Just being there was just a very humbling experience. And, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I, um pretty jealous <laughs> i would like to do it eventually when it's whenever it's opened up but uh yeah you know, i can take my time uh there's plenty of reading material out there on the subject so yeah and uh, you know also I, pick your brain yeah and i think people can go to maps.org and go down t- i think there's like a tab for like resources or training and you know you can sign up for their training email list and you know they'll keep you updated um right now yeah. some of the stuff is just closed off to phase three and researchers and whatnot but um you know it doesn't hurt to sign up and uh reach out and maybe see what what type of opportunities are out there yeah it's a big deal it is a big deal and i'm I'm happy people are doing it and that that is progressing um do you know how many they've done so far sessions with the training people I'm not too sure, but I'm guessing everybody that had to go through like these, uh, res- you know, these clinical studies had to have some sort of training. So, I mean, there's what a site in Boulder, there's uh, a site in Marin right now. I mean, South Carolina was Michael and Annie, so they created the protocol with other people. Um, you know, Vancouver has a site, I believe. So I- I'm believing, you know, all those people had to have some sort of training behind it. Um, right, right, right. You know, and I don't know, Bring this kind of uh, brings up a good point. Like, you know, if you are interested in uh, this type of research or getting involved, I mean, maybe this is a really biased statement, <laughs> but I think exposing yourself to breath work is a really good intro to it because a lot of the stuff um, that was like, ta- like that they were teaching to some extent like i was exposed to a bunch of like that non-directive approach like when you're sitting for somebody doing breath work like you know not to uh intervene and try and have an agenda you know because it's all based on that person's process um you know with breath work you learn body work um and with breath work you have your own non-ordinary experience and so you're learning about your own experience and then that kind of teaches you maybe how to be with somebody else so, I mean, 
I, the breath work, like doing studying breath work for the past six years, I think was like really beneficial for understanding some of this stuff. And I, I feel like gave me a solid foundation for, you know, wanting to move forward in a f- in this field and yeah, just having understanding. So what, I, what I'm hearing is that, you know, I, I kind of agree, but that the psychodynamics that you get exposed to and you get to witness and other folks applies really well to psychedelic psychotherapy, which is kind of the, the point we've been trying to make for a while, that it's, it's very similar material. You know, Groff says it's similar. It sounds like the Midhofers have a similar opinion to a degree. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe the big difference is that um, I think Lenny kind of gets to this often. The psychedelic stuff is just kind of to get you ready to be able to do the breath work in a group session more regularly. Mm-hmm. So, uh, because so many people have social blocks that really don't want them, don't really allow them to, to open up in a group like that. Is that right? Any of that sound right? Yeah. You know, I, but I mean, I wouldn't say like psychedelics prime you for breath work, but I mean, it definitely help, <laughs> helps, might help out a little bit knowing that like, oh, these experiences can happen in breath work. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't, I don't really mean to say prime. It's kind of like um, they'll get you able to be in a group situation. Right. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> if all goes well. Because <laughs> uh, that's a big resistance is doing breath work in group. It's a, uh, but you you have to realize that group therapy is pretty helpful. Peer peer to peer therapy is nice. It's a good thing and it seems to be gaining steam, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of good so, research that you know uh, group therapy works and works for a lot of people. Yeah, I think I think that was one of the early Tim Leary things. I think he was kind of lashing out against the establishment, saying like, "Why can't you just let the people do it? They seem to <laughs> know themselves best." Yeah. Um. So why do you need this expert, Freud-looking guy to to do that for you? You don't. Yeah. There's uh, a, I think a quote by uh, Irvin Yalom, and he he says, uh, "What is it? The the agency of change is in the group." You know. Um, right. And he's he's one of the pioneers of group, yeah. Therapy, I think. I, I think I watched some video of him. And yeah, when he, was that? Was that like the fifties, forties? I don't know. I mean, he's still alive. So, oh really? Might, yeah, it might have been during the sixties and seventies. But yeah, I have I have this huge book in in front of me. It's like I don't even know, probably six seven hundred pages. But it's like probably the Bible of group work. And yeah, it's Yalom and um, somebody else wrote it. But yeah, he's like the pioneer in group work, I think. Yeah, inpatient group psychotherapy or the theory and practice of group psychotherapy. Yeah, he's got he's got those uh videos too. Yeah. Right. Irvin, the first name. Mhm. Yeah. That's existential Y A L O M. Yeah, existential psychiatrist, I believe. I think he's a psychiatrist. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can do an episode on him someday cuz I think I think it's important to talk about psychedelics and group work. Um, cause people are obviously doing it. The Indians, um, like, uh, Native American church types, like the peyote stuff has been done in group for ages. Uh, it looks like ayahuasca has been done in group for a while at least. Um, yeah, which is uh, really interesting. I just came across an article and I posted, I retweeted it on Twitter, um, about, like traditional ayahuasca and how like the shaman would just drink ayahuasca to find the illness of a person and how the group thing is really kind of new. So I don't know. That's really fascinating to uh, compare like just how like maybe early shamans would just drink the medicine and do a journey, how it's evolved over time. And now it, it seems to be more of a group thing. Right. Yeah, it's absolutely more of a group thing now. You really rarely hear of people doing it alone. Yeah. I'm I'm sure like the folks that brew it at home and, and do it at home are doing it pretty, you know, in at least small groups if, you know, <laughs> totally alone. Yeah. But uh yeah, it's really interesting. I I think there should be some more work done there. Mhm. Um Yeah. Are there any experts you know of like the anthropology of and the history of um, ayahuasca use would that be somebody like Jeremy Narby or yeah probably Narby I'm you know 
probably Dennis McKenna. Uh, maybe Cat. He probably knows the history pretty well. And Cat yeah, Harrison Kat, too. Yeah, Cat Harrison definitely. Um, yeah, there, there's a few people. I, you know, if you look at any of those conferences and look at like the ayahuasca tracks, um, there's people that definitely know the history. I, I attended some. I just can't remember the names. Um, of every everybody out there doing research. So we're coming up on an hour. Um, what I want to do now is kind of, well, anything else, any closing thoughts before we jump um, on your training? I mean, takeaways is trust your process and don't get ahead of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, I think that was the sum of my week is just and I think I, I think I, I'm saying that now because I'm in such a weird transition state and I'm trying to balance so much stuff and um, you know with this project with school with some of my other projects and it's like I, I got my hands in so many things and I'm like all right how do I just like focus on the things that really matter to me and you know this project is obviously something that really matters and school is definitely a priority and then it's like all right but i'm just trying to remind myself to trust the process and don't get ahead of it you know just like be in the moment be with it don't try to like escape it and don't try and push it away don't try to like resolve it when it's not in the process of being resolved and um so, I mean, that that was the biggest takeaway just because I'm in like a weird transition f- state and there's just a lot going on in my life right now. And yeah. Like, my brain <laughs> just is like this cosmic soup where things are just <laughs> constantly swirling. I'm like, oh, how do, I, how do I get grounded and balance all this stuff? Yeah. It's like slowing down the information input temporarily helps, but you know, as a student, it's almost impossible yeah. until you're done, done your semester. Yeah, I've noticed um, I've noticed my dyslexia and things like that have gotten exponentially worse over the past few months. <laughs> <laughs> so cool, cool. I, th- I think that's good. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna start, I think, a series of podcasts um, doing kind of documentary, maybe if we're lucky, book reviews too. Um, and we both, um, well, Kyle finished the movie, but. Uh, I'm I'm working on it. Embrace the serpent. Embrace of the serpent. Yeah, embrace of the serpent. 2015 movie. I think it was out of Spain. I'm not positive, but it won a ton of awards. Um, it talks about Schultes, who is kind of like uh, one of the first guys to go into the Amazon in the 40s and, and get data about ayahuasca. Um, and it also splits. Um, it kind of jumps back and forth between his story. And the story from like 1904 of, I don't know the guy's name. It's like Theodore. It's Theodore von Rouse or something, something like that. Like that yeah. um, and talks about his attempt at anthropology in the jungle too. And I'm only like 40 minutes in and it's pretty amazing. But, you know, we'll probably do an episode on that uh, really soon. Um, Aubrey Marcus from On It, good friends with Joe Rogan. Uh, business partners with Joe Rogan with on it um, made a spent a ton of money on a documentary on ayahuasca called drink the jungle. I think mm. that'll be cool to do. That's that's online for free. Just type in um, drink the jungle ayahuasca. You'll probably find it. Um, I think uh, rack Razum started a video series recently. Yeah. About um, healers. Okay. So that, that might be fun to watch too. There's a, um, an MDMA movie that came out last month, I think. I don't, I don't remember what it's called, but that might be neat to talk about. Um, there's a Salvia there's, movie coming up too, right? I really hope so. It, it looks like they actually had a really unfortunate circumstance. The director died. Oh, really? So they're trying to fund the production, I guess the editing. They have all the film. They just need to get money together to, to do that. So mm-hmm. if you just search Salvia documentary, you can you can find that. Um, I I'm really curious. I I think there's some really fascinating stuff we could talk about related to Salvia. I don't mm. like it's a it's kind of a horrifying drug, but it's a terribly <laughs> interesting drug. It too. is. I remember uh, what was it? Seeing Peter Addy's presentation. I think it was at Horizon. It's not last year. I think it was like a few years ago, but. He he said that it's like one of the most potent psychedelics like 
on the chemical level, like how much you actually need. It, 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 That's you know, fascinating. I think you were saying it's like more potent than DMT. Just like the percentage of the chemical that you actually need is just, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a potent substance and it's weird. I mean, <laughs> it is such a weird drug. I, I don't really know how to describe it. Um, you know, go to Eruid and check out the vault of stories there or just, I don't know, YouTube and do a search for salvia stories yeah and you know the visual representation of it it's not that great you just look like a you're stoned your eyes closed um but the interior stuff that's happening is outrageously <laughs> complex yeah and then there's and also this phenomena where like there something pushes you sometimes you hear these things of like there's this twisting energy or yeah. this or crushing, crushing down energy. yeah, yeah. it's fascinating <laughs> like i I, I, I really want to understand it more. And that, you know, this kind of stuff, <laughs> just this, this speculation right here is one of the reasons why psychedelics are so interesting. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is it neurologically, spiritually, whatever that's going on to make these experiences happen from these chemicals? You know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and then how it shifts your relationship to the universe and life, you know, it's like, what what else is more interesting than that? Like understanding your own story, understanding your own relationship to the universe and how different experiences shape that. I mean, I think that's, I mean, that's what we're here in life doing, right? Just trying to figure it out. And yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. So I, th I think we're good for now. Um, if you guys want to help us out at all, just supporting the show, um, you know, maybe tell two friends about it. Maybe like us on Facebook, give us a review on iTunes. You could be the first review on iTunes. There still is not one. I think we have some reviews on Stitcher, but I'm, I'm not positive on that. I think there's one um, review on Stitcher right now. Yeah. So iTunes reviews really help us out right now. It looks like um, when people go and check us out, they're like, who are these people? They don't even have any reviews or star ratings. Hmm. Yeah. Even a star rating would really help us out on iTunes. Um, for all you iPhone, iTunes users, I, I know it's going away. <coughs> I barely use iTunes anymore. I use Stitcher. I'm an Android guy, but I do use iTunes just for the show. Mm -hmm. um, uh, anything else? You know, maybe subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're going to keep putting out some YouTube videos here and there and sign up for our email list. Uh, go to our website, psychedelicstoday.com and you'll, you'll see the sign up list there and uh, you can find out about classes we're doing, webinars we're putting on, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Instagram too. We've been having some cool interactions with some folks on Instagram. So keep that up. We like interacting with folks. Yeah. Thank you all for talking to us and, and thank you all for listening. Right now we've exceeded 7,000 downloads um, total and we're still a pretty young project and podcast. So it feels great. And we haven't really gotten too aggressive uh, yet with our marketing. So yeah. it's all kind of organic word of mouth. And that is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Yeah. We really appreciate you guys and we'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Bye.